Aid commercial program is sponsored by National Canine Academy. WNIS Radio and Sinclair Communications do not endorse or warranty any statements or claims that are made or products or services that are offered by this sponsor. Who let the dog sound? Who let the dog sound? Who let the dog sound? Welcome to National Canine Academy. I'm your host, Dan Stallings, and I'm joined by my lovely co host, Dallas Bolin. How you doing, Dallas? I'm good. And of course, our main man on the dial is Damien. Hey, hey. hey man, welcome to the uh, Super Bowl edition That's of right. National Canine Academy Radio. We uh, we have a, a great show planned for you guys. You can hear uh, one of our working canines, Mavic, here in the background panting away. She's been a busy little uh, dog in the studio this evening, or this morning, I should say. And uh, we have a great show. We have some uh, really great people that are going to be joining us later in the show. We have. Uh, um, uh, Gosh, I forgot her name. Tracy Hockner from uh, Dog Talk NPR Radio. And then uh, her uh, friend of hers, Martin Locke from uh, the Spectrum Group, is going to be on to talk about uh, vaccinations and uh, titers and things like that. And then, of course, Christine Lacoste from uh, PetsAdvisor.com is going to bring us the dog news of the week. But yeah, this is a special uh, Super Bowl Sunday edition of National Canine Academy. So we're all uh, wearing our jerseys here in the studio, and even <laughs> Mavic's been crawling around in hers and squirming out of it so uh but you know there are uh, there are no nfl teams with dog uh, nicknames like there are you know hmm. called like the uga bulldogs yeah. or the the timberwolves with basketball and... yeah there's there's no the nfl huh. teams but, but you know the the washington redskins they've been on them about changing their name yeah i've heard that hey the washington wine runners there, there it is you heard it here first <laughs> right. that would be cool they could have like Gray home jerseys and and the the dark blue, you know the the blue. Yeah, they could, look, ha- they could have like, sharp. It'd they, be good colors. They could have big ears painted on the side of the helmet <laughs> and the nose. And the, think yeah. about it. It'd probably get a lot of fans and a lot of uh, you know family friendly fans. <laughs> well, the National Canine Academy could definitely be the uh, the headquarters for the fan club because we have a lot of mascots. Yeah, mm-hmm. running the rescue. But yeah, you may not like it now, but think about it. It'll, yeah. it'll run the Washington there Wine Runners. There you go. Be the first team in the uh, NFL with a canine related nickname so well, well dan are you gonna watch the super bowl or the puppy bowl or are you gonna switch over at halftime have you have you watched that i've puppy flipped bowl? to it before i've well, seen it on tv i've watched it i you think have to watch it for a second one, one time but what we do yeah you get it all day in life if huh? that's the puppy bowl then we have the uh, regular season and the divisional playoffs at national canine <laughs> academy right. every day so. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so uh, yeah you know invariably i'll flip over and watch just to see what kind of puppies they have on and but yeah i don't really watch that because we get it every day <laughs> sure, but, sure. but yeah i'll be watching the uh the game later How about you guys uh yeah i don't not a big football fan but i'm gonna watch it with my yeah. boyfriend and my dad so uh-huh. yeah yeah of course. I'll, I'll probably watch it why not yeah i'll be there some of the dogs watching and enjoying so uh look forward to that um mm-hmm. but uh anyway back to the show on <laughs> this the super bowl edition of national canine academy we're going to talk a little bit today about uh vaccines and uh, it's been a, actually a controversial subject with a lot of people for years now. And, uh, you know, with the wine runners, with the rescue, with our personal dogs, um, wine runners are actually, I believe it's a, our luck, are the one breed that uh, is well known for uh, having adverse reactions to vaccines as puppies, severe reactions. And because of that, um, the Wine Runner Club of America actually has a special protocol in which they do not recommend you vaccinating Wine Runner puppies as you would most others, where you're giving you know, four and five ways. They recommend uh, doing two sets of shots spaced out over se- several weeks and then doing titers after that. Titers are where they draw a blood sample and check the antibodies to see if the previous vaccines uh, are showing uh, effectiveness and the antibodies are active and they're protecting the, the puppies. Um, yeah, they are the one breed that is known for that kind of issues, and they are known to have severe reactions. So uh, drawing titers is something that I do with my dogs, and uh, this, uh, this new group, the Spectrum Group, has a new set of titers out. And the cool thing about this is it can actually be done in the veterinarian's office. Typically, the assay has to be sent out to a lab, and you wait up to a week, and it can be quite expensive, which is one of the... Uh, reasons why people don't do titers. Um, in my opinion, it is uh, it is better for the dogs as opposed to over vaccinating. And there's the big controversy over, you know, the one year versus the three year shots. And, and whether they're actually the same vaccine, it's just they give you a three year extension on it. But uh, 
So I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about this. They actually sent me a, uh, a, a little tighter kit that uh, we're going to try to get our veterinarians uh, to look at because, again, I do it. I have uh, one of my dogs, Duke. Mm-hmm. Who's my, my million dollar baby? Mm-hmm. He had a uh, an immune disorder as a puppy, which almost killed him. His own body was attacking him, and uh, I know Mavic. I'm telling him, and uh, he gets titers drawn every year to make sure that the uh, antibodies are still effective, so we don't have to vaccinate him and overstimulate his immune system, which could kill him. So, something I'm very interested in. I look forward to having uh, Tracy Hockner on. We had her on our very first show over a year ago. She came on and. Uh, very knowledgeable lady she also rescues and she has a a wine runner that she rescued herself so we've been friends for quite a long time she was actually the first one that had uh that uh talked about maverick and i well before it was on the internet before it was on abc world news before he showed at westminster she was the first one to actually put his story out there so i always feel a little uh debt of gratitude with her but uh, back to the, uh, the vaccines, as you know, if you do get a puppy, if you've been listening all along and you've chosen a, a breed and you've got a puppy, one of the first things you want to do is obviously take them to a vet and have them checked out and make sure that they're up to date on their vaccines. And there's an entire protocol that you go through only with puppies that you do that. And uh, you get them done every few weeks as opposed to uh, when the dog's a year old or, or so, then you get the shots once a year or every three years. So uh, what, we, uh, what we do is we want to talk a little bit about that uh, protocol you go through where you'll get their series of shots. With you know, Weimaraz, for example, we get a series of two to three. Most puppies, you get uh, about four sets of shots, based out about a month apart. You can obviously uh, you know, talk to your vet about that. Um, every dog is different. And uh, you know, again, the wine runners have uh, the, the big issue, but every puppy is different. You do need to look at their particular needs. There are a lot of vaccines out there, not just the normal ones that the vets give, the DHPP, the distemper, hepatitis, parvo, parainfluenza, and the rabies, which, of course, is required by state law. But then there's, you know, the Bordetella, which we require, which is for commonly referred to as kennel cough, which is really just a doggy cold, but it is very contagious. You have Giardia, which is something if you, like, you take me and take your dog for a walk mm-hmm. a lot of times. A lot of it. Yeah, so there's a the Giardia vaccine that they, you know, were to eat the remains are uh, the stools of another animal. They oh, can yeah. get that. That bobcat uh, droppings, he, he loves those. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've had to deworm them and get, right. get, yep. do a lot of research on the best on and, that. And so. if you're out hiking with him and he drinks a little po- uh, pond water yeah. or from the, the had lake that problem or in the puddles, swamp. yeah, they can get Jardia from that. And then you have things like um, uh, some vets still give the coronavirus. It's rare, but some vets do give that. Um, there's uh, leptospirosis, which is they can also get from wildlife, coming in contact hmm. with the waste from wildlife. Um, and then there's a few others. There's canine influenza, which was big a few years ago. We were actually the first uh, daycare facility in the area to talk about it since we were traveling and showing and competing. And uh, it really started in Florida and worked its way all the way up to uh, New York. However, it did skip over most of Virginia. There was a case in northern Virginia. I heard there might have been a case in Williamsburg, but it was never uh, validated. But it's really quieted down. But that is another vaccine. It's a canine influenza. It's not related to the influenza that people get. It's not zoonotic, but um, there is a, a canine influenza. And then, uh, you know, there's, so there's, there's quite a few vaccines. So over-vaccination has been a big, big issue. And it's been uh, debated for years now. And uh, that's why I'm so interested in learning more about these, um, these titers because I'm getting more and more involved in that. And as I said, the Wine Runner Club of America specifically recommends doing titers after the first two sets. And then some people continue to, continue to do titers even through the adulthood. So it is a, a topic that we want to discuss here. And we're going to have um, Tracy Hockner from uh, uh, Dog Talk. She's the uh, Pet Talk radio lady on NPR. And we're going to have her on in just a few minutes. So... We will be back after this break with uh, Tracy Hockner, and we'll talk more about uh, titers and vaccines. And you're listening to National Canine Academy Radio on AM 790 WNIS.
Your source for news, sports, and information is AM850 WTAR. Wake up with America's first news on the Wall Street Journal this morning from 6 to 9 a.m. In middays, get the best in sports talk with Fox Sports. Then in the afternoon, it's Michael Savage live from 3 to 6. And at night, it's more from Fox Sports, TMZ, and Red Eye Radio. News, sports, information on your radio at AM850. On the web at WTAR.com. AM 850 WTAR. National K-9 Academy uses all of its 26,000 square foot fence grass play area, two saltwater pools, and professional trainers to ensure all dogs get plenty of exercise, socialization, and obedience training each day. Every dog is individually trained by a professional trainer. They're the only training facility in the region offering a lifetime money-back guarantee. Call 289-2700. National K-9 Academy, where dogs play, stay, and train like a champion. Visit NationalK9Academy.com. Wouldn't it be nice to walk your dog without them pulling, barking, or jumping on people? This segment is brought to you by National K9 Academy, and we can help. We offer all breed obedience training, behavior modification, plenty of socialization, plenty of exercise, three professional trainers, male and female. We offer a money back guarantee on all of our training for as long as you have that dog. We're located at 5503 Virginia Beach Boulevard, or you can call us at 757-289-2700. You can also find us on Facebook and on the web, www.nationalk9academy.com. That's national, the letter K, the number nine, academy.com. National Canine Academy, where your dog can play, stay, and uh, train like a champion. All right. Uh, welcome uh, to the show now, Tracy Hockner, the uh, pet talk lady. How you doing, Tracy? Hey, I'm great, Dan. It's Hotchner, but it's not that important. <laughs> you say Hockner, I say Hotchner. Well, actually, it's Hotchner because everyone gets to say how their name is pronounced. But it's great to be back and wonderful to know that you are thriving with the bed bug wimes and and your training and boarding, it's wonderful. You're, you're making such a great use of these terrific dogs in your community. Well, thank you. And you have a, a, a re- quite a few rescues yourself, including a rescue one. Yes, I almost fell prey to one of your puppies when you had your amazing, <laughs> amazing brood. But then I realized that two of my guys would have been very unfriendly to a new pup. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's rescue all the way for me when, when one of these guys goes to over the Rainbow Bridge. I'll be probably knocking on your door and seeing who you've got under your roof. But one of the things that I'm really interested in is this issue of revaccination. So many people with non-Weimer honors feel nervous about revaccinating, but they don't really know what they're nervous about. And what you should be nervous about is bombarding your dog's immunity system with uh, diseases, if you will, that it doesn't need because it already has immunity to them. Mm-hmm. And I guess we do know with the Wymes that the Weimar Honor Club of America that you mentioned and Friends for Pets, which is the Wyme Rescue in Sunland, California, where, where my pooches came from, uh, she told me the minute that I adopted a Wyme, never, ever revaccinate these dogs with all of the vaccines at once. So I thought that was the whole point in the beginning. Just don't do them all at once. But it turns out that many of them never have to be done again throughout the dog's whole life. Right. And but, people... how would, but how would you know? Right. So mm-hmm. Years ago, I asked my vet, well, can you check the titer? Check the blood to see whether the dog has immunity to those diseases. And it was an expensive, complicated test. It, it had to be sent away. You had to get the notification from the vet two weeks later, pay for another vet visit, come back, get revaccinated if you needed it. But it's now expensive, with too. Check, they do it right in the office, and, and they were so amazing. They, I know they want to send a kit of Vaxacheck to you with your Tri-State Wyme Rescue, and they did send one to Friends for Pets, to Diane Monahan, and she had an incredible experience, Dan. Mm-hmm. They had recently gotten a dog with a badly broken leg, a Wyme. I believe she had been th- some, one of those stories you think, really is this possible thrown out of a car on the freeway in california broken leg from it taken in by whomever they got it to the wine rescue she had to have surgery and they didn't know the dog's history so they have 40 wimes there in their in their in the home that she bought to make into a rescue and they would have had to revaccinate her because they would have had no way of knowing if she was protected for her sake and the sake of the other dogs they did the vaccine check test all of her titers were high she either had been vaccinated repeatedly or just once and had taken, and they didn't have to vaccinate her at all. And with the surgery she was going through and the trauma and the stress, 
it was really great to avoid that. But I think a lot of people are nervous about the word vaccination for themselves and for their dogs. And, Mm -hmm. you know, you and I get a vaccination when we're kids. Well, kids today get it for mumps and measles and life-threatening childhood diseases. But it's not like they revaccinate them every three years for the rest of their life. Right. I mean, you're, you have immunity or you, or you don't, but you don't know for sure if you've gotten immunity. And the great way to know is with vaccine check or someone like you who's breeding. It's really important for breeders. that People don't understand why so many puppy shots are given. And like you were saying, the Wine Club of America says, after the second set, check and see if it worked. Well, the reason it doesn't work is because the puppies have immunity through their mother's milk assuming you hope to heaven that the mother was immunized properly. Right. But the minute they stop suckling, the next day, they aren't getting that immunity unless their own system, you know, has somehow kicked in. So that's why they need the puppy shots, and the puppy shots have to overlap because there's no way of knowing scientifically, externally without a test, how long in each puppy, because each one's an individual, how long did that mother's milk give them immunity for? Because if you give the shot when a puppy still has the mother's milk immunity, the shot is pointless. The body goes, I don't need that. But if you give it two weeks later when the immunity has dropped off from the mother's milk, then the body says, okay, I'll develop antibodies to that disease. So it's great for puppies, and it's great for rehomed rescue dogs. And it's great for my 12-year-old Wyme Scooby-Doo. He doesn't need anything more thrown into his body, unless maybe he really does. So you do a VAXA check, and you find out what his titers are. And as you said, with a boarding facility, how often is my dog going to come into contact with any dogs that might have parvo or distemper? I live in Vermont, in the middle of nowhere. He hasn't come into contact with any dog. So really, in his case, the titer's almost irrelevant. But if he were to go to a dog park or come to, to a training facility or be boarded with you, he'd need to be immunized for his safety, and obviously the safety of your other inhabitants. So being able to check a 12-year-old is kind of great. Well, it's also, it's, you know, when I travel to dog shows or if I go to a dog diving event where you're around a lot of other dogs, like Damien, when he takes his dog for hikes, may encounter other dogs. There's wildlife you have to worry about. But, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, when I did have my litter, um, I insisted on all my uh, puppy uh, owners that they follow the WCA protocol. And like I did, several of them had to argue with the vets a little bit over this is what I want done with my puppy. And some of the vets weren't comfortable with doing the titers after a few weeks, but all of them followed through with it. And all the puppies are happy. They're healthy. They're just over a year now. None of them have been sick. Knock on wood. Nice. nice. So, and maybe some of them needed revaccination and some didn't, or maybe only to one element of the core diseases, not all of them. Actually, none of them. They all came back uh, showing a um, high level of antibodies for each nice. of the vaccines. So, yeah, I was very happy with that. And, and believe me, it was, I have to admit, I was a little nervous, especially in the environment I'm in. Sure. You know, over 100 dogs a day coming and going, going That's to dog true. shows with a puppy, and there's 2,500 other dogs in this huge arena. Yeah, I was nervous, but... They've been happy and healthy and playful and just, you know, normal wine runners. And I'm glad I didn't over-vaccinate them. And so it is a, a, a topic that's very relevant to me. Also with the rescues, you know, one of the first things you do when you get a rescue in, especially if it was a stray, here we go, right to the vet, you know, get them vaccinated. Now there's other options with doing the titers. Yep. And the nice thing is you do it right then and there. Mm-hmm. It's not, especially with a rescue o- or you got to travel, you got to board your dog. You can't wait the week, the four days, the three days to get the results from some lab far away and then go back and make another vet appointment. I mean, it's time, it's money. You don't have either one in some cases. So wait the 15 minutes. They tell you right then and there, you're good on this, you're good on that. This one, the the, the immunity didn't take. And and every puppy is an individual. And every batch of, I even think every batch of vaccines could be, they're not 100% they, they never say any vaccine is 100%. Mm-hmm. They're not 100% guaranteed, and they're not 100% exactly the same from batch to batch. Right. I had a Bedlington Terrier um, as a girl who came from a nice Bedlington breeder. It's not like there's any puppy mills for Bedlingtons. I mean, they're so rare. You know, you're never going to, you're only going to find one from a breeder. And he'd had his shots, and he got distemper. Now, if I had been able to check him as soon as I went for my well puppy visit, I would vaccine check didn't exist then we're talking the dark ages of my childhood but if i had i was like oh heavens to betsy this dog is safe against parvo has no immunity to distemper 
could have revaccinated him right then and there. He didn't die from it. I got him through it. But he never looked right. He never acted right. He didn't look like a Bedlington. It was just really weird. He, he just grew up looking different, you know, didn't have white, tightly curled, lammy hair. He had gray, wavy hair his whole life. So well, you it know, obviously had a weird effect on him. You know, Tracy, one of the questions I have, and I need to, um, uh, maybe I'll talk with, um, I think it's Mervyn that's calling in, um, and also talk to a vet. But of, of spectrum labs that, that makes vaccines. Right. So uh, w- the thing I'm curious about is, you know, they have the, the titers for parvo, the titers for distemper, and then for hepatitis. So what I've seen, though, is, you know, I've, I've been in the, the room when the vets bring in the vial to give the uh, vaccine is a lot of times the, the vials are already a four-way. It's DHP or DHPP. So if the titer come back, comes back okay for parvo and hepatitis but low for distemper, how are they going to give just the distemper vaccine? Great question. They have to order it, and your vet's going to have to step up and go to an extra step and have their office manager order it. Okay. They come prepackaged as a four-way, but they exist separately. Okay, good. You can ask Mervin because he knows all about the science of these things. He's a scientist. But you absolutely can get them individually. That's why from Wyme Rescue that I got my first two Wymes from, she said that they should not ever be given a four-way. Not ever. Right. They must be split up. And they should be given three, you know, some weeks apart. Well, that is something that's sort of protocol anyway. Yeah, the, the vet has to go to the extra trouble of ordering it separately, and they might be annoyed by that. But you know what? What It's like so many things we ask of our vets. We're going to ask them to use a new product, to look at things a new way, to try it a different way. It's for the health of the dogs. And maybe if they have to order you know, a bunch of them individually, then they'll offer it to another puppy owner or another dog owner. Would you like to be checked and only be vaccinated for the stuff you need? You're if right, you're right. The, if they've got the tools there, if the tools are in their toolbox, they're much more apt to use them. If they say, I don't have that tool in my toolbox, you can say, would you please get the tool? No, it, I, you know, it's, it's just, uh, it's kind of so logical, but they're like, well, we, we, that's not what we usually do. Well, then do something different. What can we, we're all just trying to educate each other, right? And we're trying to do what's best for the dogs, and that's obviously what the vets want as well. It's exactly. just Well, they do, but they're people, any of us, gets very stuck in the old way. I mean, I only know how to get one way to where I play tennis. There's probably six ways. There might be a better way, not the place with the speed trap where I got a ticket, but I only know how to get there one way. And a lot of vets only know how to do things one way, and there's a comfort level with that. So well, we, I guess we got to shake things up a little bit. Right, and it was, you know, just like my vet when we, you know, I got in the discussion with her over it. I mean, she it wasn't that she was she was, wanted to do something that, you know, she didn't feel was appropriate. She was worried for the dog. And it was getting her comfortable with just doing titers. Yes. And like I said, I was nervous too, but we were all had the same thing. We wanted to do what was best for the puppies. And in the end, you know, we all agreed, and that's what we did in the titers. And like I said, they've been great. So it's, it's also getting their comfort level with it. And I'm not sure how comfortable a lot of vets are with it. And that's where, you know, hopefully, you know, Mervyn and, uh, and uh, you know, Martin and you can help with that and, you know, talking to the local vets uh, in and people's areas. And really Empowering people. I think Nancy, Dr. Nancy Kay wrote a book called Speaking for Spots. It's a really good book. Mm-hmm. And she wrote another book, of, I forget what it's called, something like reason, Five Reasonable Things You Can Expect from Your Vet. Well, one of them is that you have to be the advocate for your pet. That's just it. You don't go to the great sage who's the Oracle of Delphi and say, tell me everything, I'll do whatever you want. You come there to have a conversation. You have to come with some expectations and some information and some knowledge you did not get from Dr. Google. You got it from a, a, a reasonable, responsible source, and you engage them in a conversation. And vets are going to have to learn to do that with owners. The more educated an owner is, the more demanding, the better the vet is going to be at, at what they do because they have to reconsider what they're doing and uh, listen to reason. There's no, it's not about emotionally comfortable. The fact of a titer showing that you have immunity is a fact, a proven fact. So... That's just something, uh, I used to be a volunteer EMT for eight years in East Hampton. They check you to see if, you know, you've ever had hep C or you've ever had hep A. It shows if your body's ever had it. So this is the same thing. If the puppy or the adult dog has ha- developed immunity to a disease, it's not like, well, I'm not comfortable with that tighter level. It just proves that animal is completely protected against that disease but not against these other ones. Well, that, that's what we're all about here on the show, and that's what we're going to talk with Mervyn about in just a second. Thank you so much, Tracy. We'll, uh, Dan, you're doing good stuff.
up. Thank you. I appreciate Take it. Care. All right. Bye -bye. Tracy Hockner from uh, the uh, Dog Talk Lady. We'll be back in just a few minutes with uh, Mervin from the Spectrum Group. You're listening to National Canine Academy on AM 790 WNIS. You keep going over your plans and you want to make sure that they're tight, and we think we've done that. Things that we were worried about as far as the weather, how are we going to do that with our troopers, how are we going to move them in and out, you know, that's been taken out of the equation, and we're very thankful. It feels like Miami compared to the last week. Kevin Fowler of the New Jersey State Police kickoffs at 6.30 Eastern. Just because the State Department report in the Keystone Pipeline shows that it will not harm the environment, that doesn't mean the matter's settled. Other agencies are looking into its feasibility, too. We have one department with a study. Now we have other expert agencies, the EPA, and many others who have an opportunity, the Energy Department, an opportunity to look at this and make their determinations. White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough on NBC's Meet the Press, who says the final decision rests with President Obama. Fox News. We report. You decide. Hi. My name is Mike Impreventa with the law firm of Bright, Drescher, Impreventa and Walker. You know, I'm an avid motorcyclist. I ride among you. I even race motorcycles. I have a very personal understanding of what happens in the dynamics of a motorcycle accident. I can bring this knowledge to bear to help you. If your ride goes bad, call me, Mike Imprevento, at 622-6000, 622-6000. Or contact the law firm of Bright, Drescher, Impreventa and Walker at brightdrescher.com. The greatest threat to America is the $17.3 trillion in federal debt and over $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities owed to Social Security, Medicare, pensions, and other entitlement programs. This is Steve Burton, president of Equity One, and I've been warning that the debt would lead to slow economic growth, market volatility, higher taxes, and high unemployment. If you're concerned about these things, then join us at the Roos Chris Steakhouse in Virginia Beach on Thursday, February the 6th, or at the Riverstone Chop House in Suffolk on Tuesday, February the 11th. Call 1-877-313-4080. You will learn things about your 401ks, TSPs, IRAs that most people don't know. Learn how to maximize your income while working and how to create a lifetime of retirement income. To join us at the Roos Chris Steakhouse on Thursday, February the 6th, or at the Riverstone Chop House in Suffolk on Tuesday, February the 11th at 6.30 p.m., call 1-877-313-4080 or online at cashflowmoneywave.com. This is a paid commercial program that is sponsored by National Canine Academy. WNIS Radio and Sinclair Communications do not endorse or warranty any statements or claims that are made or products or services that are offered by this sponsor. Welcome back to National Canine Academy Radio. This segment is brought to you by Maverick Detection Services, the region's largest and the nation's largest independent canine detection teams with 17 certified bed bug canine detection teams we use multiple canines on every single inspection we do canines are proven to be up to 98 percent accurate twice as accurate as a trained technician we offer large-scale inspections uh, clearance certificates are available we do, do both initial and follow-up inspections and our teams are quiet quick accurate and discreet only you will know we've been there we also perform canine geese control for nuisance flocks of geese for both residential and commercial so if you need us give us a call 855-597-7827 you can also look us up on the web at www.todetectandtoserve.com all right well we'd like to welcome to the show now mervin levine from the spectrum group how are you mervin good thank you and yourself doing fine thank you thank you for joining us Oh, it's my pleasure. I don't know if you uh, you heard uh, Tracy on before, but she's a huge proponent of yours, and I'm very interested in uh, your uh, your new uh, tighter system. That especially since it's able to be done in the office, that's a huge, huge advance. And uh, yeah, right, I mean, one of the biggest obstacles to tighter testing, uh, other than the uh, than the uh, stuck in their way type of mentality, has been the fact that the test has had to be sent out. It's taken several days for results to get back, and it's been relatively expensive. Right. Uh, and now we've been able to cut down all of those barriers where a test costs no, uh, look very little more than just the cost of a vaccination, but can save a life. And I've done um, titers on quite a few of my dogs and occasionally a few rescues uh, for health reasons. And uh, typically, I don't think people under know that titers are typically two to three times more expensive than the vaccines themselves, but that's not the case with uh, with the vaccine check you have no not at all and, and this is a relatively inexpensive test which is done in the vet's office and one of the beauties is that uh, the test itself takes 20 minutes so 
it's while the patient uh, and the owner are still in the clinic. So if uh, the titer is low and there is vaccination required, we don't have to bring them back for another office visit uh, and another time. It can all be done at the same time as part of the same office visit. Well, now, how long have, has VaxiCheck been available? Um, it's actually been available worldwide for a number of years. We've had, uh, we've had it in the United States now for a little over two years, uh, just from the time the USDA uh, gave us uh, a permit to import them here into the U.S. And uh, it's, it's been going great guns. It's been well accepted by uh, a large segment of the community, and it's, it's uh, acceptance growing on a daily basis. The, it's, you know, it's like Tracy was saying, old habits die hard. And um, we, we do things sometimes, not really knowing why we do them, or not even or our teachers don't even really know why they taught us that i mean many of us have asked questions of uh, infectious disease specialists at the veterinary schools and said well why are we recommending vaccinations once a year and they said well because that's the way it's all been done <laughs> uh, but nobody can really point to where or why that came from so the first obstacle was was getting vets to switch from an annual uh, vaccine protocol to a once every three years mm -hmm. uh, and, and then now the question is do they even need it at the three-year period now we don't want to just turn around and say no they don't but certainly by tighter testing we can ascertain whether in fact they do or they don't uh, and there's another aspect to it and that's the under vaccination uh, and another thing i mean years ago we uh, used to vaccinate uh, puppies at six weeks and then send them off to their permanent homes uh, we now know, for example, that if we start vaccination anything before uh, 12 weeks, uh, we've got maternal antibody interfering with the vaccination, and it's basically moot giving the vaccination. The maternal antibody is going to uh, take over and reject it. However, that maternal antibody has got a life of its own, and once it has passed through the system, then there's no longer any immunity. So we start at uh, 12 weeks, we do another one at 14 weeks, and another one at 16 weeks, and that works for most puppies. However, there's a percentage that after 16 weeks still haven't taken. And we go on the assumption that because they've had their 16-week shot, which is their third shot, that they're covered and protected and we don't need to do them uh, for another year. And that's the most vulnerable point of their lives, that, uh, that first year of their lives. And we're, we're going on that assumption, whereas a percentage of those uh, dogs, in fact, are not covered and will require another shot at 18 weeks to get them fully protected. And again, one of the advantages of titering is knowing if we fall into that category or not. Now, I, I understand you guys, obviously, you're, you're far quicker than sending the assay out to an uh, uh, independent lab. You're obviously far less expensive. And I see you guys also offer that service where they can send the assay out to you. Um, so those are some of the obvious advantages. Now, I guess with my comfort level and then with the comfort level of the vets, um, how effective has this been proven against sending the assay out to you know a mainstream lab, independent lab, versus doing it right there in the vet's right. office? Well, you know, the good thing is, you know, in the industry we all complain about the, how long it takes to get products registered in the United States, but there's obviously a good reason for that. And uh, the USDA have very, very strict uh, requirements of studies and double blinds and controls, et cetera. And there are two basic gold standards in titer testing that are used in laboratories. Uh, and this test has been run and standardized against both of those uh, at the University of uh, Madison in Wisconsin at the vet school there. And uh, the results showed in excess of 97% correlation between the two gold standards. Uh, it's the only test that has shown such high correlation, and it's the only uh, kit per se that offers all three vaccines, the PAVA, the STEMPA, and the adenovirus. So uh, we know that there's absolute correlation. Uh, and the other thing is every batch of kits that gets manufactured, a number of those kits have to get sent in to the USDA for verification uh, against the so-called gold standard until, uh, before we can actually release them to, uh, for sale. So there, there's quite a few quality control steps in place, and it sounds like... 
Oh, totally. And uh, we, we, know, we know the correlation has been excellent. Um, Professor Ron Schultz at uh, Madison, who is uh, the uh, epidemiologist, or the uh, infectious disease specialist there, rather, um, is, uh, uh, has always been a proponent, proponent of titer testing, uh, but doing it the old way. And he is now fully converted in his mind. Uh, and he, in fact, did a lot of the studies for us uh, as an outside consultant, not as part of the team. Okay. Now I see uh, on your brochure you uh, have feline VaxiCheck coming soon as well, so you'll have these for yes. cats as well? F F feline is on its way. Um, feline was just a little bit different because uh, there is no gold standard. Uh, for some reason, the, uh, the, the two tests that became the gold standard in the, in the canine took a little bit, uh, didn't really take off on the, on the, on the feline side, and they haven't done it been anywhere near as many studies. So uh, we've had to establish gold standards to satisfy the regulatory authorities before we were able to get licensing. Now, we're hoping to any day receive the license uh, for that and uh, start selling the kits. The kits are basically ready to go, and the first batch will be manufactured as soon as we get given the green light, which is almost uh, a pity that it took that way around. I mean, that's not, not to minimize the importance of vaccinating dogs and the effects of over-vaccination on dogs. But in the case of cats, uh, we see that there are more problems with over-vaccination. And one of the most common is uh, osteosarcoma, uh, which at the, at the injection site. And in fact, some of the literature, and this is appalling, but some of the literature actually, actually recommends giving the, the vaccine above the knee so that in the event that amputation will be required, uh, it, can only be, it only has to be done you know, from that point. So um, vaccinosis, which is long-term vaccine side effects, is a major issue. Uh, vets are starting to come to realize it. It's just a question of changing the way they do things. Today's standard veterinary practice, when you ask a veterinarian what their practice is, they say that they have the patient come in for the annual wellness visit, which includes the vaccinations. And the way to get the client to come in is for the vaccine. And that's understandable. It's important for the vet to see the patient on a regular basis, to be able to preempt uh, chronic diseases in the early stages. No. Uh, now, if you take vaccine out of the picture, many people won't, in fact, bring their pets in, and this is where we vets are concerned. So what, what the World Small Animal Veterinary Congress and the American Animal Hospital Association have both come out with in position papers is that we don't have, no, no longer have an annual vaccine visit, but we have the annual antibody titer test wellness visit. So they come in for their titer test, if and when they need the vaccine, then they get given it. If they don't, at least the vet is seeing them for uh, the full checkup. Well, and they're supposed the to come in for... 80% or more will never need it after the, end, after the first year uh, booster shot. Well, they're supposed to come in yearly for their annual checkup, their health uh, heartworm check and, and such. So I don't think it's, it's that far out. Now, do you have any idea of the statistics of, of you know, what, how many dogs actually have a reaction to the vaccines? You know, unfortunately, um, because so many of them are unrecognized, we don't really know because we, we, there's so many side effects which aren't necessarily attributed mm -hmm. to vaccinosis, which we now know that are related. In fact, uh, meningitis is something that we wouldn't relate to, uh, to a vaccine reaction. And yet, uh, it, it, it's an issue. Uh, osteosarcomas and, and general sarcomas at the sites of the vaccination too are, um, are are a thing. And then, so the patient comes in a year or eighteen months after the vaccine. The vaccine is totally off the radar when those symptoms present. But it's estimated that probably a good um, fifty percent of these chronic issues that are related from inflammatory diseases are in fact due to over vaccination okay well if our listeners are interested in uh finding out more information about this um and if they would like to get their their vet get this information to their vet how can they uh, go about finding more information out about this uh spectrum group and vaccine check right if they go to www.wearespectrum.com w-e-a-r-e spectrum.com um, there'll be a direction to the various products and tests that we have, and one of those will be directly to the VaxiCheck site. 
there is actually a, uh, a section there for pet parents, and one of the things is for them to print off a little brochure uh, with a coupon that they can actually take into their veterinarian uh, and say, you know, this is something that I'd like you to look into and something that I'd like you to consider. And we do get we, uh, a number of veterinarians on a daily basis that are calling us and saying, I've had a patient requested, please tell me about it, send me the information, and they start using it. Well, very good. Well, I'm definitely going to uh, pass on your brochures to all my uh, puppy owners moving forward, and uh, we're going to do what we can to let uh, local vets here know about uh, the Spectrum Group and VaxiCheck, and I, I appreciate you coming on, Mervin. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks all right. for the time. Thank you. We'll be back in just a second with Christine Lacoste from PetsAdvisor.com with the Dog News of the Week. You're listening to National Canine Academy Radio on AM790 WNIS. source for news, sports, and information is AM850 WTAR. Wake up with America's first news on the Wall Street Journal this morning from 6 to 9 a.m. In middays, get the best in sports talk with Fox Sports. Then in the afternoon, it's Michael Savage live from 3 to 6. And at night, it's more from Fox Sports, TMZ, and Red Eye Radio. News, sports, information on your radio at AM850, on the web at WTAR.com. AM850 WTAR. Kayak, rowboat, rubber dinghy. All electronic tolling is coming to the downtown and midtown tunnels. Snorkel, scuba suit, surfboard, dude. There are many ways to cross. Submarine, sailboard, mm, jet ski. But the easiest and cheapest way is Easy Pass. Hydrofoil, hydroplane. Oh, parasailing. With no toll boots, no stopping to pay, and no hassles. Inner tube, makeshift raft, <laughs> motorcycle jump. Don't wait. Tolling begins February 2014 on the Elizabeth River Tunnels. Pole vault, trampoline, teleportation. Get your easy pass at driveert.com. Dolphin ride, hot air balloon. Shot out of a cannon. Or call 855-ERT-ROAD today. Sea turtle transportation, breaststroke, backstroke, Victorian diving helmet. Welcome back to National Canine Academy Radio. This segment is brought to you by PetAdvisor.com. And on the line right now we have Christine Lacoste. How are you, Christine? Doing good. How are you, Dallas? I'm good. Hey, Christine. Hey, Dan. All right, so what kind of uh, pet news you got for us this week? I'm going to sneak in one little cat story really quick. Okay. Uh, this is about uh, Home Depot. Uh, for 13 years, a stray cat was actually um, just commonly seen in a regular Home Depot in uh, Bluffton, South Carolina. And re- recently, the cat was starting to cause problems because she kept tripping the alarm system. So Home Depot said she had to go. Um, it seems the customers and the employees all started an online petition in favor of the cat, and eventually it was decided that Home Depot will allow the cat to stay there, but they need to find a permanent home that's a lot safer. And for this 13-year-old cat, so obviously, you know, considered a senior. Um, as the story has been gaining publicity, offered, offers to adopt a cat have been coming as far as Germany. So I think that Home Depot, well named Depot, will get a home soon. And she can oh. help with uh, home improvement. <laughs> <laughs> the All right. next interesting story comes uh, from Greece. This is a, about a 10-month-old German shepherd named Sandy. Uh, the dog was abandoned in Greece because he had extremely bowed front legs. Uh, it, there's a picture of it on the Pets Advisor Buzz site, but it was pretty pretty sad to look at. Um, it was difficult for him to walk, and also he was partially blind. Um, when Pat Clark, who manages Mutt's in Distress Charity in England, learned about the dog, uh, she tried to find a way to get the dog to Britain, which she was successful. And um, a vet surgeon agreed to do the surgery for free during his downtime, and they got the plates needed to straighten his legs. Um, th- those were donated. So the dog's already had the first surgery, which was a success, and now is just waiting for the second one. Cool. I, I wish more people would, would give rescues with you know some issues medical issues a chance we've had one dog who, uh, who uh had to have one eye removed we've had you know we have one now that has a, a chf congestive heart failure you know we've had the the seniors the 11 and 12 year olds um we've had epileptic rescue mm-hmm. i have uh, mavic in the studio with us was diagnosed with life uh lymphoma 
you know, four years ago. So obviously she was misdiagnosed. But, you know, I wish people would give them a chance just because they have some kind of medical issue doesn't mean it's going to be a huge headache or a huge financial burden and, you know, the, the reward you get. Let's see, this dog to be thrown out with the bowed legs. As it is, he has trouble walking. So now he's in a stray situation. It's going to be almost impossible for him to get food or any kind of care right. to get away from danger. Mm-hmm. But luckily, it worked out. Good. Um, now, tell us a little bit about this puppy that was chasing a cat and gets stuck in the gate. <laughs> that happened in England. Um, <laughs> the dog ended up chasing the cat and gets stuck. Ran straight into the gate, got the headstock, had to get the firefighters to come out and Uh-oh. actually saw her off the uh, the gate to get wow. it off the puppy's head. And in a related story, the dog union in England has put out a bolo, a be on the lookout for an orange tabby cat, considered <laughs> considered clawed and dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> that's funny. The, the puppy's okay though, right? The puppy's fine. Good, okay. Lesson learned. Yeah. Happy ending. Um, The next story actually comes from down here in Louisiana. Uh, Two emaciated pit bull dogs have been found on the streets in Harahan, which is a suburb not too far outside New Orleans. Uh, The dogs were later named Peanut and Butter, uh, but they were barely alive when they were found. Um, They were taken into animal control, and they got them treated, got them fed. And the Humane Society director of Louisiana, uh, Jeff Dorson, heard about the dogs and was moved enough to action to start a pit bull appreciation day. the admission was free. Um, it happened last Sunday and apparently was wildly successful. Um, admission let everyone get up close and personal with pit bulls, ask questions. Um, Tia Torres from Pitbull and Parolees was there as well. Oh, wow. And um, But Peanut and Butter are still waiting to be adopted. But step in the right direction. That's cool. That's good. And then next is a war dog story. Um, you might have heard of this one already, but it's been uh, 10 years since uh, this dog named Basher was living in Iraq. In 2004, Army Major Mike Fenzel didn't want to leave the dog there, um, and he tried to find a way to get the dog back to the United States to his father. Um, Air Force wouldn't let him, shipping companies wouldn't, and then finally an animal hospital in Kuwait agreed to fly the dog. So the dog was flown to Illinois to live with Fenzel's father. And now that Mike's stationed in Fort Bragg, he can visit his dad often because he's back in the States. So good story there, 10 years in the U.S., and dog is safe. Now, this was uh, just a, a dog that he found or, or came across over there, or was this one of the working dogs? Yeah, he just found the dog, and he didn't want to leave it in Iraq. So he tried to find a way to get the dog home. We had uh, a, a dog that was uh, brought over from Iraq by a, Sam, a vet. Sam, wasn't it? Yeah, Samantha. Um, and we had, there were... Uh, little puppy pictures and it became like the mascot for the camp and uh you know and talking with him he said you know a lot of the higher-ups kind of frown upon that and they even wanted to get the, the get rid of the dog uh, kick him out of the camp but all the uh the guys there fought because it was like a little piece of home and you know they bonded with the puppy and watched him grow up and he ended up uh when he came back stateside he brought the puppy to us for training and she was with us for about a year and he just relocated down to florida mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it was a pretty close, some sort of uh, tribal dog, they call them, over there. And they're just wandering all over the place. And um, he came across her roadside when she was, he thought she was about eight weeks old. And now made a wonderful pet. There were plenty of pictures of her running around the field with other dogs. So it's, it's kind of cool. I wish they would uh, do more to help mm-hmm. with, uh, you know, officers bringing some of the, uh, the, the dogs back. That's nice. You still get to hear a few stories of some of the dogs missing it out of there. Not saying that, you know. Well, that, that they puppy have a serious problem with strays over there, but I think that you know strays are everywhere. Yeah, but that puppy helped you know boost the morale of everybody in that camp. I mean, you know, we don't know what it's like being over there day after day, but you know that, that puppy uh, kind of brought a little relief and a little stress relief to all the guys in, in the camp over there, putting their life on the line for us every day. You know, it'd be nice if we could just let some of the officers bring them back and keep them as companion dogs. You know, especially with the, all the PTSD going on. And some of the training that you know we're doing with some of these dogs for these uh, these uh, uh, retired military, and even active duty, it'd be nice if they would let them come back. I think it would help with some of the uh, issues that they have when they do come back stateside. Definitely. So, any other good news for us? Uh, I got one other one. Um, this is about an eight-year-old girl, and she had a problem with her puppy. Apparently, she lives in a neighborhood where they've had a problem with speeders driving down the street too fast. 
um, eight-year-old patient Lemley of Arkansas was heartbroken when she watched her dog lie on the road after getting hit. Um, he had been run over by a, a speeding car. The young girl donated her entire savings, which were actually intended for college funding and a trip to Disney World, to pay the dog's medical bill. And she also set up a meeting with the county sheriff to discuss the speeding problems in her neighborhood. Uh, the sheriff's department ended up donating $85 towards the veterinary expenses for Brownie, who suffered uh, severe brain swelling from the accident. But fortunately, the dog is expected to make a full recovery, so that's some good news. And <laughs> Giving up your savings for your pet, that's love. Yeah, unfortunately, it took a little girl to get the adults to come to their senses. Wow. Well, that's the thing. With her, I don't know if it was her idea or her parents, but reaching out and having, you know, sitting down having a conversation with the sheriff's office about speeding, I mean, that just goes to show you she's far beyond her years. Cool. Very cool. Now, uh, you have an update for us on uh, some uh, some special shelter dogs? Um, if you live in Texas, know someone who does or has space for these dogs, um, we talked about magic and spirit. Um, magic was found with spirit. Uh, spirit was adopted pretty quickly. Uh, magic suffered um, an eye infection that caused his eye to be removed and kind of makes him look like he's got this little permanent wink. Uh, he's still at the shelter. and He's been there for two years on his own since his brother was adopted, so... If you need more information, if you're interested, or you've got anyone who has space that could take them in, uh, just go to PetAdvisor.com and just contact us, and we'll get you in touch with the person you need to speak to. Uh, the other two dogs, Gwen and Rowdy, these two dogs have been in a Texas shelter for seven years. The shelter life is the only thing they've ever known. They're still waiting for a home. So if you're interested in possibly taking two dogs, please let us know. Well, that would be awesome. Now, uh... Is it uh, next week that you're going to be in New York? Yes, I'll be calling in from New York City on Sunday. And you're covering uh, a, a dog show or something up there? <laughs> uh, just a little bitty one. <laughs> Are you going to be there? You might have heard about it. You yeah. might have. I think you might have been there before. Oh, oh that, that <laughs> uh, Westminster dog show thing, I think. It's on TV. It's the oldest dog show in the country kind of thing. Yes, yeah. uh, you can follow us on Facebook on Pets Advisor or visit our website, uh, PetsAdvisor.com. We'll be posting updates, pictures, video, uh, tons of coverage from the day, well, two days. Cool, and you're going up there next weekend? Yes. Okay, so you'll be calling in live from the Big Apple week after the Super Bowl. It's like yes. the Super Bowl of dog shows. It's going to be an interesting day. Uh, speaking of the Super Bowl... Uh, well, I think we should give a little appreciation to our bomb-sniffing dogs. Uh, apparently a couple dozen of them were sent to New Jersey to um, the airport, the stadium itself. So they're out, they're out there working today. Keeping everybody safe, absolutely. All of our working dogs everywhere, military and police, a big thank you from National Canine Academy. Yeah, they're mainly labs or lab mixes that are up there right now. Um, the 12 weeks of training, they estimated at $200,000. Yeah, it, it takes a while, as we well know. Well, very cool. Yeah. Well, what can, uh, where can we find out more information on these stories that you uh, you call us in every week with? Uh, PetAdvisor.com. Just click on the buzz button on the top menu. That'll take you to all the news stories. Of course, you can always search Pet Advisor for any special keywords, anything you're interested in, advice for your cat, your dog, even your parrot. <laughs> very good. And then there's a link to National Canine Academy Radio on uh, PetAdvisor.com as well. So we appreciate you joining us once again. Enjoy the, uh, the Super Bowl and your travels to New York. We'll look forward to talking to you next week from the, the Big Apple. Sounds good. All right. Take care, Christine. That's Christine Lacoste from PetAdvisor.com. Well, thank you guys for joining us once again. We look forward to uh, coming back next week. We have some more great information about uh, getting a dog and what to do as, as a responsible owner. We'll talk more about our working dogs. And uh, we'll see you next week, Dallas. All right, Damien, you'll be good, man. See you then. Uh, you've been listening to National Canine Academy Radio on AM 790 WNIS. The preceding paid commercial program was sponsored by National Canine Academy. WNIS Radio and Sinclair Communications do not endorse or warranty any statements or claims that are made or products or services that are offered by this Hampton Roads News and Information Station, AM 790 WNIS Norfolk. It's 11 a.m.